Tonight on A Turning Point, we're celebrating Cleveland's Hispanic and Latino community. What's the difference between Hispanic and Latino? And let's not forget Latinx. We've invited members from the community to weigh in on identity and the terms they use to identify. The 2020 census shows the Hispanic population in Northeast Ohio is growing. How this increase in diversity is impacting everything from healthcare to corporate America and how law enforcement trains its officers. And as the community's numbers grow, so do their voices at the polls, the potential influence on election day. We also look at preserving Cleveland's Mexican-American history, the story behind a building that holds special significance in the community, even though the building will be no more what's being done to keep its memory. Those stories and more tonight on a special edition of Front Row, A Turning Point, next. Good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us tonight. This is Front Row, a turning point, and tonight's special focus is on continued contributions of the Hispanic and Latino community here in Northeast Ohio. I'm Jim Donovan, alongside of Sarah Schuchman and Lydia Sparra. And it's so great to be with you guys, especially for this special. You as well. Yeah, very excited for it. So our special coincides with National Hispanic Heritage Month. It started back in 1968 by Congress as Hispanic Heritage Week, but it expanded to a month long in 1988. How nice. And Hispanics have played a major role in driving U.S. population growth over the past decade. In fact, that includes here at home. While the 2020 census data shows much of Northeast Ohio's population is shrinking, that data also shows the Hispanic population in Cuyahoga County is rising a great deal, up 36% in the last decade alone. And one city is becoming a new hotspot of Hispanic influence. Why empanadas? It's the Spanish version of the pierogi, yeah. And we actually have a Polish empanada just because we're in Polish village. We were like, let's, let's stuff them with everything, you know? In Parma's Polish village, Jennifer and Alberto Quinones opened empanadas two years ago to a crowd. We felt the love. We yeah. felt the love. We yeah. felt like people really, really genuinely wanted to try our food and wanted to support a local business. Their success is one visible example of Parma's growing Latino community. The couple now owns three businesses on this block of Ridge Road. First, a t-shirt shop opened in 2015. Then empanadas, then last year they opened Tropical Mini Mart to bring the flavors of their native Puerto Rico to Parma. I want to bring the island here. I wish I could bring the heat here, but we can't. <laughs> All those items that you can't find here, I want to bring them. Jennifer moved to Cleveland for a federal government job, recruited out of college. The West Side instantly felt like home. I found a church right away that was Spanish-speaking church. Everywhere you go in the West Side, there's somebody that can that speaks Spanish. And that's what I liked. That felt like home. Last year, the Quinones moved their five kids to Parma, where Jennifer liked the schools and could afford new construction. And we were like, this is it. We have our business here, and we're going to have our home here. Over the last 10 years, the Hispanic population has basically doubled here in Parma. When I tell you that, are you surprised by that at all? Parma has great neighborhoods, safe neighborhoods, and good schools. But also, the hurricane, Maria. It happened in 2017, and a lot of people lost everything. When they left, they came to family. Family is here, and then when they were able to find a job and get established here, then they'll migrate to the suburbs. The new census numbers reflect stories like the Quinones. In 10 years, Parma's Hispanic community has grown from 2,915 people in 2010 to 5,564 people in 2020, second in growth only to Cleveland. Cuyahoga County gained more than 22,000 Hispanic residents, or 36 percent growth, while the total population declined 1.2 percent. Parma wasn't always seen as welcoming, particularly to African Americans. In 1980, a federal court ruled Parma had practiced deliberate racial exclusion for decades. Not always, but again, back in the 80s, there was a history with Parma. Now Mayor Tim DeGeter says all new residents are greeted with care packages on their doorstep. He says the proximity to downtown and its parks are big sellers. We have so many wonderful things to offer here. We're safe, we got great housing. 
um, affordable housing. I think that makes us attractive. And while the city has no specific programs to support Latinos, it relies on its partnerships, like those with its churches and Cuyahoga County Public Libraries. We try to take care of everybody and do great things. Advocates remind us there is a potential undercount in the census, too, because of the pandemic and concerns about citizenship raised by the previous administration. Sarah, empanadas are also called pastelillos. That's how I was raised eating those. Okay, while the growing <laughs> Hispanic and Latino population in Northeast Ohio has the potential to make an impact on Election Day, Leon Bibb explains. It is a growing community of people and one exercising its political influence. The Latino community of Cleveland, just as in other parts of the country, Latinos are showing political muscle. Nationwide Latinos are 20% of the population, largest of racial minority groups. In Cleveland, they are 13% of the population. We have a, a growing political you know, body that will allow our community to be seen and heard. Selena Pagan, executive director of Cleveland's Young Latino Network, understands the political potential Cleveland Latinos have in their hands. She contends for years Latinos have been what she terms on the back burner and forgotten. But there is a power shift and Pagan sees it rushing in. Any candidate courting local votes has to campaign in the Latino community. As well, Latino voters have to understand their potential power through voter registration and more. We need to prepare and equip our people to really self-educate in this process, right? Because this political process and this democracy is not easy and voter suppression is real. Pagan prefers the term Latino over Hispanic. Latino refers to people who are from or have descended from people from Latin America. Pagan is quick to point out the group is not a monolithic group because Latinos come from different backgrounds. We have Latinos, Latinas, Latinx individuals from every country in Latin America and Caribbean and Northeast Ohio. And people oftentimes forget that. But together, there is a strength which is growing with a population looking to gain more political momentum. West 25th Street and Clark Avenue in the heart of the Latino community of Cleveland Pagan calls Cleveland a slow-moving train as far as Latino progress, but she is optimistic that that train is picking up speed because of political power and political strength. This is going to be the last election that Latinos, Latinas, Latinx individuals will be on the back burner and will be forgotten because um, coming these next couple of elections, you will see the power that we have. For 3 News, I'm Leon Bibb. Well, Leon just touched on this, but do you understand the difference between the terms Hispanic and Latino or Latina? Jorge Ramos Pantoja explains. Hispanic Heritage Month is finally here. From September 15th to October 15th, we celebrate the influence of Hispanics and Latinos to the culture, history, and achievements of the United States of America. But do you know the difference between Hispanic and Latino? Let me explain. Hispanic means any person from or whose ancestors were from a Spanish-speaking land or culture. So Mexico, Spain, Cuba, Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, and all countries in Central and South America, except Brazil. Why not Brazilians? Portuguese is the official language of Brazil, so the Hispanic term doesn't really apply to them, but they can still identify as Latinos. Who else can identify as Latino? Any person with a Latin American background. Brazilians, people from French Guiana, Guadeloupe, Martinique, St. Barthélemy, St. Martin, and most Spanish-speaking countries, even if they don't speak Spanish, would identify as Latino. And one more thing, Latino, Latina, and Latinx definitions. In Spanish, traditionally speaking, all nouns and pronouns have a gender. So Latino is used as a noun or adjective to describe males or mixed gender groups of people with Latin American roots. Latina is the feminine form, and Latinx describes a person or organization that prefers gender neutral terms. So there you go, whether you're Hispanic, Latino, Latina, Latinx, or none of the above, we hope you enjoy celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month with us through October 15th. For 3 News, I'm Jorge Ramos Pantoja. Well, Jorge also sat down earlier this week with three members of the community to discuss the identity Latinx. 
the term Latinx? Is it here to stay or should we use other terms as Mexican, um, Cuban nationality, if you will? Or the term Hispanic. I guess that, that, that that's a, a question without an answer, you know, because you you cannot predict the future. You cannot predict how the language will evolve and how it will modify. We have to think that. Actually, language is reflecting what is happening in society, as Bella was saying. I mean, there are so many things going on. There are so many changes happening already in the society. How we perceive um, uh, uh, people with a different sexual orientation, with a different uh, ethnic uh, background, we are changing our perception about ourselves. And language is just reflecting that. Believe it or not, Latinx is in the uh, Webster Dictionary. It was added in 20, 2018. So it's there. It's here to stay as a use of a verb and, or a, a noun, however you want to put it, I just think in my generation, I just don't see it panning out. You know, I'm a, just a, a believer that, you know, we've had such a struggle with Latino and Hispanics to get to the table at the corporate level, at the political level, using those terms uh, in documents and, and so forth, and just the way it's been rooted. Maybe I'm old school, you know, maybe I'm one of those that, you know, I got a younger generation with my kids, you know, they, they understand the word of uh, what Latinx is. And, that, and that's okay. That's fine. Do I feel the Latinx and Latina are going to be here this day? I know that I'm going to be using them. And I know that my, ch my child uses them as a she, they. So it's important to just remember pronouns are important as a show of respect. And a lot of people are not even ready to have the pronoun conversation. I can't tell you how many times we have had to have this conversation at home about, hey, Mom is mom, but mom is now they, them, ella, because linguistics always evolve. We're not speaking Spanish, Spanish. <laughs> Spanish don't think that Latino Spanish is good or Latinx Spanish is good, period. <laughs> so do I see those words saying? Yeah. Now, you can find the complete 40-minute conversation over at our website, WKYC.com, under A Turning Point. Coming up in an innovative training for law enforcement, how a conversation spurred an effort to break down barriers when it comes to interaction with Ohio State Troopers. Lorraine County is one of the most densely populated Hispanic counties in the entire state, and many residents come directly from Latin American countries. As Marissa Signs shows us, the Ohio State Highway Patrol has created an innovative training in an effort to break down barriers. So let's start right away. I'm a, I am in the goal for today's presentation. In a nutshell, it started with, you know, just two people sitting down and, you know, one saying to the other, Tell me about yourself. Ohio State Trooper Sergeant Ray Santiago sat down with Victor Leandri, the executive director of El Centro, a nonprofit Latino organization aimed to boost the socioeconomic status for Latinos. That's when a revelation occurred. The conversation, I remember, it was over an hour and it was very fluent, very honest, very it felt organic. Who are our neighbors? Who, who do we live with? Who are we serving? That's when the Getting to Know Your Neighbor program was born, a training that's never been done before in Ohio. It starts with those who make up Lorraine County, Latinos, and lots of us. Lorraine is so unique in regards to the Latino community. According to information gathered by El Centro, there are more than 30,000 Latinos in the county. And that's just those who filled out a census form. The majority of Latinos in Lorraine are Puerto Rican, coming directly from the island, speaking only Spanish or broken English. I've had, you know, traffic stops where someone's been out with, you know, someone that didn't speak, speak English. There are certain situations that, that we're in that during those interactions, there's just simple miscommunications. Which sometimes results in frustration and confusion. Understanding those and helping navigate through those situations um, really makes a big difference and not just, you know, the result of those interactions, but also the perception of the individual that you're interacting with. One of the most common misunderstandings, names. In Puerto Rico, I used to go by Victor Luis Leandri Vasquez. Uh, and now here I go by Victor Leandri. In Latin American countries, it's customary to use a first name, middle name, paternal last name, followed by a maternal last name. As part of the tradition, part of the respect for the female that carry you for nine months. But for those who are new to American traditions, a social worker or police officer may use variations when entering their name into a system. They're giving a combination of their name. It's not that the individual is being deceitful. 
there was a simple misunderstanding. Simple cultural education is the goal in this training. When you really sit down and dissect what it is, it's so elementary. And training Ohio State troopers is just the first step to educating more people. I think there's going to be several aha moments. This training is not only for police. This training can be used for hospital, health, uh, schools. Marissa signs. When we can kind of close that gap and better explain, that's when, you know, we can better serve. Three news. Next, preserving local history, the movement behind making sure a Cleveland building's legacy isn't lost. Club Azteca is, is a building in Cleveland's Gordon Square, and it is said to be knocked down, but it holds significance to the Mexican community. Brandon Simmons shows us how their legacy will make it live on. It is important to preserve this history because for so long, this history has been buried. This history has not been allowed to come to light because the stories of Latinos and Latinas, Latinx, Latinx Chicano, Mexicano individual success in America has never been something that has been allowed to be spoken to. A lot of us live our lives here invisibly. Bella Sin is part of the Comité Mexicano de Cleveland, an organization that promotes Mexican art and culture in Northeast Ohio. That organization, along with the Young Latino Network and the Cleveland Foundation, are partnering to preserve Club Azteca's history and legacy. I want everybody to think of a broader term than just the Azteca and the building itself. There is a multitude of things that happen there politically, they happen there historically, that need to be talked about in a broader term. This is not just Mexican history, Chicano history, this is Cleveland Latino history. Club Azteca in the Gordon Square area is a simple one-story rectangular building, but it holds the untold stories and experiences lived by many Mexican and Latino immigrants who settled in Cleveland from the 1950s to the 2010s. It was a home away from home, hosting Christmas parties, Mexican Independence Day, and Cinco de Mayo celebrations. It was a haven where people could organize around political issues and celebrate their native food, language, and music. And when the idea of demolishing the building was presented publicly to Cleveland's Landmarks Commission in February, the Latino community rallied together in an attempt to save an important piece of history. When we think of losing these institutions, we think of, of thousands of people that are going to lose their history and their roots, right? And understanding how important these little buildings are to us is crucial. Based on the proposed plan for new mixed-use development on the site of Club Azteca, the building will be removed by the end of the year. Bella Sin, along with other community leaders, are working on placing a historical marker at the site, archiving a collection of items including signs, programs, and photos, and adding to the archival information available at the Western Reserve Historical Society and other public institutions. One of the things that I need to make clear is that nobody owns this history is the history of the people that lived it, that were just trying to collect an archive so generations coming, our generation now, can have access to that and not feel so invisible in history. For a turning point, I'm Brandon Simmons, 3 News. Now, the leaders of this project say their future goal is to create a Latino museum here in Northeast Ohio, but right now they're focusing on examining and organizing items of Club Azteca. Just last month in Lake County, nonprofit Ola Ohio began building a new Hispanic community center and commercial kitchen. It will be a hub for support services, job training, and a business incubator. Meanwhile, a Hispanic woman living in the U.S. has a 1 in 10 chance of developing breast cancer. While that's better than the national average, our community also has obstacles to medical care and breast health education. Senior health correspondent Monica Robbins tells us how a mother and daughter joined forces to bridge that gap. Metro Health's Breast Amigas Unitas program started as a grassroots effort. There is a need in Cleveland's Hispanic communities for accurate information and access to care. Their mission is their name, bringing education, advocacy, and support together from friends. Camille Garcia manages the program with passion and a unique perspective. Her mother, Carmen, is a breast cancer survivor. In 2006 or so, she became involved with the Amigas part, um, which is the volunteers of the advocates through the grassroots efforts that they were doing educating women at churches. She asked her daughter for help. I was like, sure, I'll go volunteer at, at some community events for Breast Cancer um, Awareness Month. And 
I got to know the team and later on when I was looking for, <laughs> for work or change um, in, in a different uh, career, I always felt passionate about it and the doors open. Camille is now the manager of the Community Health Outreach Cancer Center at Metro. Her mom is not the only inspiration for her work. She lost two aunts, her mother's sisters, to breast cancer. I'm considered high risk for developing breast cancer over my lifetime, so my family's very aware of the screening guidelines that we have to do for ourselves. The program not only provides mammograms and education, in 16 years they've diagnosed 70 women with breast cancer. The team is fluent in Spanish and also navigates women through the healthcare system and prepares them for what's next. They've educated 50,000 women, and 60% of them have returned at least three times for continued screening. They also help those who lack insurance or are underinsured find help. Teaching women that it's okay to take care of her health, and especially in the Hispanic community, women are always last in taking care of themselves. Camille and her team teach them to be vigilant. We know the importance of advocating to other women, like you need to get screened, or at least also know your family history. Monica Robbins. Do you know the 100 most influential Latinos in Northeast Ohio? Well, Mancia Moreno's mission is making sure you do. Moreno founded and more AM More Consulting, and recently she sat down with a group from WKYC Studios for what we call a lunch and learn day. She educated and inspired our group to learn the ins and outs of the area's Latinx population and why it's so important. Without you knowing more about the community being involved as a news organization or as any company, right, you're going to have a very biased and, as I said, unidimensional view. Um, so I, you know, I want to change that. Two of WKYC's own are on that 100 Latinos to know list. Reporter and producer Jorge Ramos Pantoja and producer Rosalind Munez. Congratulations to both of them. And we want to remind you, it's also Cleveland Latino Restaurant Week. Among the restaurants participating are Blue Habanero, both the Cleveland and Brexville location, the Campus Grill, Latin and Berea, and Panada's Latin Street Food in Parma. Thanks for joining us.